So we're going to get started. Donna's going to join me and we're going to do a you can click your Robert so your slide populates. We're going to do a RAD 101 for everybody. It's important to understand the RAD program, even if you're on the GRP. So when RAD came about, we need a little background, right? For public housing, it was the first deep subsidy program that we had, right? It was important around right after World War II. And general occupancy, elderly persons with disabilities, you can click Robert. Keep clicking two more times, I think. Yeah. As the program age, right? One of the issues that the public housing program was facing was funding, right? Funding was just not keeping up. And what does that mean? Well, the public housing funding at what program has two funding um, uh, slugs. One is capital funds. It addresses capital needs, things like roofs, water heaters, right? It's kitchens and operating funds. Operating expenses, right? So that's, and then you have a tenant rent. We'll get into that a little bit later, but that's what the Congress allocates each and every year capital funds and operating funds. That's how the public housing program is operated. Do you guys think Congress will be funded the public housing program year over year? No, no, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't have a RAD program, would we? So we think, I think there's a kind of metric that is, uh, it's like a handful of years ago now. At that time, the backlog of all public housing stock was $50 billion. We're actually thinking with inflation plus the five years, that's actually, I know we say 75, we're thinking it's approaching 100 billion. So talking about a big problem, it's like the Glacier and Titanic kind of thing happening here right now. Now, each year, I would say over the past 20, we've seen anywhere from 1.6 billion to 3.2 billion funded through the capital fund program. If you take 3.2 is actually a high watermark, but right, public housing, we'll get in a little bit. It's a bit of a roller coaster ride when it comes to funding, right? 3.2 billion, you have 900 plus thousand units of public housing. Let's do the math real quick. It's like $3,500 a unit. Now, look, some housing authorities get more, some get less. The capital fund formula is based on age of the asset, right? So, 3,500 a unit, that's, uh, that's tough. Water here goes out and there's your budget, right? The other challenge and issue public housing was facing was between 95 and 2012, we had something called demolition and disposition authority. So that's through section 18. Section 18 allows a housing authority to demolish public housing or to sell it. That happens pretty often actually. And through those 17 years, we were losing 10,000 units a year. They were not being replaced. Do the math. 10,000. Conservative estimate, three and a household, 17 years, half a million people don't have a home. So funding's not keeping up. We're not, we're not keeping up our hard stock, right? We're not supplying affordable housing. Challenges, right? I'm going to hand it over to Donna for the next side because fast forward years and years later, we're going to go to Carly in a minute after, uh, after Robert does the next slide. Fast forward 30 years and we go to practice, but Carly, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask, can you explain like exactly what you mean by the capital fund? The capital fund is a funding that's allocated by the Congress to address capital needs. So each housing authority gets a slug of funding. There's actually something called a capital fund formula. And depending how old your stock is, if it was new construction, if it was rehab at the time, how it became public housing, how old it is, how well it's been replaced. You get an amount for your whole public housing portfolio, right? So some housing authorities may get a good chunk, some get less, but it averages out to about 3,500 a unit if you were to say everybody got an even split, but it's not an even split, but it's strictly for capital repairs. It could also be used, right? Some housing authorities with a view of their capital funds as public housing is they replace items, sometimes smaller scale breaks or sometimes larger scale, like, hey, let's do all of our roofs. Yes, sure. Let me jump in there because this, this is a critical piece. This is one of the reasons that RAD exists is because public housing is funded by a slug of money from the federal government to the housing authority, not based on the condition of the property, not based on the number of units in a particular property, not based on the number of buildings, but just the overall portfolio They've got five amps, right? Most of us are familiar with the asset management uh, plan, which is a project um, that 
the formula that John is alluding to goes to both operating and capital. So basically, they plug in a little computer every year and say, this property is 10 years old, this property is 20 years old, this property is 50 years old. And based on our numbers, they need $100 a year. And everybody in this room knows that's not nearly enough, right? That's the capital shortfall, right? In addition to that, they say, okay, on average, how much does it take to operate a unit? Well, that's $1,000 a unit. So combine those two together, the $1,000 a unit that they get for operating and $100 they get for capital, that gets you to the $1,100 of subsidy that we're going to provide. And then the tenants pay 30% of the income, which can be anywhere from $100 to $500. And we'll have a slide of it, yeah, and we'll kind of break down how that looks. But it's very important, John's right, the formula is the problem. Right, the capital fund formula is the problem because it's not um, enough. Like, yeah, and just a caveat to that too. Um, we're talking about the needs of the property, but there is also a part where you get, uh, if you're a high performer, you get more, a little bit more. So if your property is doing well, you actually get more money. Birds are doing the doing bad. Which is evil founder and do it, but you know, because those folks don't need that, that's right, right? They're doing well, right? It should be out, right? I'm going to turn it over to Donna because you know, in the, in the 90s, we started our PRAC program, that's right. And so, for those of you who are unfamiliar with PRACs, PRACs are project rental assistance contracts, and these contracts started right around 92 93 uh, when Congress allowed for. Um, the building and re or renovation of um, homes for the elderly. These are homes, this, these PRAC contracts um, really uh, support homes for the elderly. Uh, there's another section of PRAC that we're looking to, and, and Austin is very uh, clear, we're working on those as well. Uh, but these are project rental assistance uh, contracts, and um, they allow RAD owners, um, many of uh, PRAC owners, are, all PRAC owners are nonprofits. Some of them are PHAs, but the majority of them are, are small and large nonprofits around the country. That could be a church or that could be a huge nonprofit uh, organization. So um, to convert their PRAC contract to a Section 8 so that the project, project can be put on a more solid foundation, just like Robert just talked about the budgets. These were budget-based um, contracts. And so it's based on these formulas that say the size of this property is determined by, you know, the, the rent for this property is determined by the size or, or this area that they're in and not necessarily the actual needs of the property. And so one of the things that we're doing the RAD for multifamily is we're looking to convert those PRAC contracts over to the Section 8 platform, which allows them to take on equity, debt, um, other sources of income, which they cannot do now under the PRAC program um, to be able to support their capital needs. Because they at that first uh, slide that you saw, they started around 92, 93. That's over 30 years now without major capital needs. So we're finding that uh, many of these properties really need much more additional income to be able to take them much farther into the future. So a key takeaway is both public housing and PRACs both have, as you can hear, artificially low rents. They're actually two of the three lowest funded programs that we have here at home, right? They also cannot take on our debt. So how do you do a recapitalization as a public housing property or as a PRAC property? Good luck. There are some programs you can try to do it, but without debt, that's a pretty tough, tough thing to do. So what problems are we trying to solve with RAD, right? We were underfunded. We are losing hard units, right? Well, Section 8. Section 8's been around since the 80s. It's tried and true. It's really tied to the market. People understand it. They're comfortable with it. But with Section 8, you can take on hard debt. There's a value all of a sudden. Whereas before, as a public housing property or PRAC property, there's not value there. It's not really worth much, right? Switch it to Section 8, all of a sudden there's a value being generated. Folks want to invest. You can actually leverage debt. You can, you can do a recapitalization. That's why RAD came about. Next slide, please. 
skip one, Robert. Oops, thanks. So RAD program has two different buckets. Largest one is RAD public housing. We've converted 190,000 or so units. Um, can convert to two streams of Section 8 project-based vouchers. That's a contract administered by a housing authority, project-based rental assistance, a contract administered by HUD. And then you have Donnerside and RAD for multifamily. And RAD for multifamily, um, as you can see here, we have, it includes the Section 202 PRAX, which is for housing for the elderly, um, Section 8 mod rehabs. Uh, many of you in the room will work on, uh, may work on PRAC projects, and their PRACs are allowed to to work with the, um, uh, to get GRRP loans or grants. Um, but we also work on Section 8 mod rehabs, and I'm not sure if you've ever heard of those. Um, these are for low and very low income families and persons who've experienced homelessness. So um, that McKinney Vento Mod Rehab SRO, though that's the uh, product for the persons who've experienced homelessness. Um, we retired uh, the rent supplement and rental assistance contracts um, that uh, HUD had for, for certain properties. Um, those properties, those con uh, uh, conversions to RAD went away in 2019. And, um, and now, like I said, we're looking to work with the Powell team and other offices around um, HUD to bring in also the Section 811 plans, which are homes for uh, dis uh, the disabled. Yeah. And, and Donna's team has done 30,000 rents up RAP units, uh, 10,000 Madria, Madria SROs, 5,000 PRACs, and counting. And counting. And those properties also can convert to Section 8 PDRA, like John said, administered by housing authorities, or Section 8 PDRA, uh, administered by HUD. So we kind of touched on this a little bit. And what problems were we trying to solve with RAD? We had to address the backlog of capital needs, right? We had to address the backlog of capital needs if we can't do recapitalization under our programs. Convert to Section 8, open up access to debt and equity, do a recapitalization, right? Mm -hmm. There's also a long-term preservation component in both programs. On the public housing side, you convert to a long-term contract, 15 to 20 years. You have to renew that in perpetuity. It never goes away, okay? On the PRAC side, I believe it's through the use. Through the, yeah, the capital advance use agreement that the property's got. Um, but it's really important because, because these properties are coming up on the end of the, the current term of their current PRAC contracts, this is a risky time. You know, cap, you know any uh, owners or developers can go out and try to petition to try to uh, gain access to these properties. And we want to preserve them for this for the elderly. And uh, so, like John said, PRAC, PRAC, the, the PRAC to RAD conversion allows for a continuous um, an extension of that conversion agreement. Uh, Different agreement, but the extension of the time frame. So we are really preserving this property into for another 30, 40, uh, 40 more years. Right. As as sorry, as homes for the elderly. And we get to simplify the program administration, right? It's section eight. A lot of folks know how to own and operate section eight housing. Public housing can be complicated, prax can be complicated. Um, they're legacy programs, really, if you want to call them that. Um, and so going onto a section eight platform with a true and tested uh, contract administration platform is, it can be a key to success. The most, I think a cornerstone, one of the most important parts is resident rights. You will not find a HUD program with the robust, robust protection of resident rights that RAD has. Every resident has a right to return, okay? And that means if they get moved temporarily, longer term, or what's called permanent relocation over a year, they have a right to return back to the project. The problem before that, through Section 18, there is no authority for that to occur, right? So people weren't coming back, right? You were losing the fabric of the community when that happened, and that stuff wasn't being rebuilt, right? So that's, that was a big problem. Our RAD deals have over 90% of them return. And if folks don't return, where do they usually go? They could take a Section 8 voucher. Or sometimes, so say you have a new construction building that's being built, the family doesn't want to wait two years, right? They could be relocated. They can voluntarily relinquish their right of return and have to go to an alternative housing option, which has to be new construction. 
right? So it has to be on the same playing field within the past few years. No other program really has this kind of protections for residents. So it's kind of key. And we also have resident engagement protections team has been stood up about two or three years ago, doing some terrific work, building capacity and outreach for housing authorities and resident councils as well. That's not full too. Hard to see this, but I think it's also back uh, the screen there for you folks in the back. You can kind of see how Section 8 has been really well funded over the years, and you kind of see this go to the amusement park down with uh, the public housing program, right? It's 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 underfunded. You can see that kind of middle line funding just hasn't kept up. We're nowhere near where we need to be, right? And the only way to get where we need to be and hit a reset button is through the RAD program. Next slide, please. Programs at a glance. So here's our actual numbers. $19 billion in construction investment. It comes out to about $85,000 a unit in investment. RAD public housing, 227,000. So that includes our RAD units, which are about 170 or so thousand, in addition to building new units, light tech, other affordable units, market rate units, all on the same project. And they'll have done a Cover yeah. RAD 2. And so with RAD 2, you see the number is a much smaller number, and that's because our product uh, are for much smaller properties. So RAD for multifamily, I mean, I'm sorry, RAD for multifamily, like I said, includes tracks and mod rehabs. Mod rehabs could literally consist of a three unit property or a four unit property or a seven unit property, right? But it doesn't mean that those properties don't need to be preserved um, for the residents who are living in them. And so we do as much uh, work on trying to convert those properties as we do on properties that are 100 units. Many of the PRAC properties average around maybe 40 units. We have some properties that are in the hundreds, but most of our properties are, are less than 100 unit properties. And so that's why you see our numbers. But tomorrow, we're so excited to show you all all of the work that our team does because we work a lot. And so and we put a lot into these uh, to our RAD conversions, as well as the other work that we do on our team. And you see uh, the results look like it's not a lot, but that's because of the type of products that we're working with. Right. And so, some might say when you have small nonprofit owners, small PHAs, Hard. the amount of investment <laughs> is, is, a, is a big investment on our part. With that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get into what fair cloth RAD means later on. But we have about 3,800 units in our pipeline, and that is essentially building new public housing. We immediately convert to Section 8. We'll get into that dynamic a little later on. Program requirements. So this is also important for your GRP folks in the room, right? Just like RAD was built off the backbones of Mark to Market, guess what GRP was built off of for your underwriting requirements? RAD program, right? So contracts and rents, right? It's predictable. You know, when you convert to Section 8, year over year, you get something called an operating cost adjustment factor. It's supposed to keep up with inflation, right? But year over year, right, we take off. So you know what you're getting into. Before I also said on the public housing side, we've hit a high watermark. We're actually at a really high, the highest funding level we've seen, right, in the public housing program. Granted, past 40 years haven't been great, right? But this is a high year, meaning, our RAD rents are actually based off our public housing rents. We'll get into that in a little bit and break it down. But if you are then to lock in this very high rent that you don't normally see, lock that into a Section 8 rent and take off, you're in a pretty good place, right? So it's predictable. You can leverage debt and equity. And on the public housing side, we have some bells and whistles. We have rent flexibilities, right? We have something called RAD Section 18 blends, which we'll get into. We have something called uh, utility savings boost. Uh, we have some, we have certain housing authorities calling moving to work agencies. They have special privileges, right, where they can augment, boost their rents as well, right? Um, you also have a neat thing called rehab assistance payments on the public housing side, where your vacant units during rehab, we give you a percentage of money, right? And that could be used as interim income during construction. That's a revenue source during construction. And the key to Section 8, which is on both sides, and Donna's going to jump into PRAC, is there's no limitation on distributions. The more efficient you run your project, like a business, the more cash in the pocket at the end of the day. That's unlimited. And so for RAD for PRACs, um, 
currently tax properties, uh, uh, tax contracts, all tax contracts are, are administered by HUD. So they're all PBRA on the on uh, on the asset management side of uh, um, of uh, of HUD. And so PRACs have, owners have to go to their asset management team, their asset management offices, and request a budget-based rent adjustment each year annually. Uh, those budget-based rent adjust adjustments over the years have been just similar to public housing, just really underfunded. Um, so again, based on what the area they're in or what the budget uh, is that they're presenting, then their budgets may or may not be approved for what they're asking for. Um, and so we, found, we find that many of these practices, again, really underfunded. So before the first step in coming into the RAG for PRAC, we say, let's get your, your rents adjusted. And one of the things we need for you to do is to, to go out and get a capital needs assessment. Let us see uh, where your property is, the needs of your property, all the components of your property, and let's adjust your, your annual reserve for replacement, which is a part of the PRAC contract rents, uh, the PRAC rents. And, um, and let's, let's get that more aligned with where we are now. And, uh, and then let's look at the operation side of the budget. For example, all PRACs are required to have supportive services for the elderly, but many of them have not been funded with the supportive services for the elderly. So the field offices have a cap at the amount that they could get uh, for supportive services. When an owner considers RAC or PRAC, they come in and they can get an additional amount in addition to what they're getting to in the field, um, if they're getting anything in the field. So that's really important because, uh, you know, uh, RAG for PRAC, again, when John talked about residents, uh, right, we want to make sure that resident services are also provided for these properties and that they're able to be paid for. So um, there was, when RAG first started, we had a cap on the rents at 120% of FMR. Recently, we had a RAG supplemental notice that came up, came out over last summer, and that got rid of that 120% cap. Now, it's really important to know most PRACs we're nowhere near 100% of FMR, let alone 120%. But there were some in certain areas where their rents were either close to it or once we did their adjustment, they went a little over. And at that time, if they came into RAD, they would have gotten a haircut and nobody wants to do that. So we were happy that that was one of the things that got approved in the RAD supplemental notice that we could get rid of that 120% um, that FMR unless unless they come in and get an additional rent boost. So if they come in and um, they get an additional, we, uh, Congress allocated in the supplemental notice, uh, 12 million over two, year, uh, over two years. And um, so now we have, you know, it's, they're using it, but we have $12 million for, um, for preservation, resiliency, um, energy and water efficiency, and design for, el um, for the elderly to age in place. So if an owner can uh, can show us how they're going to uh, to do these uh, resiliency preservation rent increase resiliency um, efforts, then they could get an additional rent boost on top of the rents that they're getting in the field, and um, and then at that point it would be capped at 120 um, percent of FMR, and then they could also qualify for utility savings um, and. That also can uh, just by the savings afford them more money into their uh, their rents. You have questions, Amir? So with the twelve million for the rent books, that uh, looks like a lot of green activity there. Yes. Was that a grant? How is that funneled? And how I know that's not GRP, but it's I know it's building off of that. But what's the interface between that? So that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Yeah, so there, I don't think there actually was a whole lot. Um, I think Congress, this is for GRP, actually was probably uh, being pushed. This this legislation had been in for years. It just hadn't gotten passed yet. So it's it was just thought of, hey, we're hearing from our stakeholders. Crack rents are low. Even with these rent adjustments, we're having trouble to get our deals to work. How can we help? Money helps. So, right? So, what it has to go, Donna said, it's time to a scope of work. A certain measure. Yeah. yeah. But, go ahead. Yeah, so, so that's a great point because as I was setting up the, you know, the, the session today, everything builds on itself. Recap has been thinking about resiliency for many years. 
So the whole GRRP concept wasn't just brand new. The Congress just didn't come up with that. Um, so the utility savings, the greening, um, you know, Carol and I worked on, others in the room worked on the green retrofit program 10 years ago, which kind of set this all up. So this is all building on itself and the idea of it trickling up and back. I think one of the things that you all are going to see as great loan specialists is a lot of the stuff that you're doing in a few years is going to roll back down into what the transaction team is doing and what Stanley and Jonathan are doing in the, you know, in the, you know, in the trenches on the RAD side, because a lot of this resiliency stuff is going back down. Right, particularly in the area of floodplain management. Okay, you know, natural disasters, that, that sort of stuff, but particularly in that. So it goes back and forth, right? But this, but the funding for this, as Donna was saying, is they're getting a rent boost. So to cover the work that they want to do, they come in and they say, you know what, we're in a coastal area, we're going to move all of our systems up above the, the base flood elevation, but we don't have enough money to do that. Well, guess what? Here's $250 per unit in a rent boost go borrow the money to pay that. So they go borrow the million dollars. Now they have the money to pay for it. So it's not a grant or a loan. It's actually in their subsidy, but they have to go out and get something to pay for it. So that's what else to Robert yeah. think. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. It goes through yeah. really hard debt. It leverages yeah. that debt. Okay. Um, and uh, it's also the 20 year contract. Uh, once the RAD for crack inversion happens, section eight contract, um, and it's adjusted also by OCAS for 20 years. And there's also no limitation on cash flow. And that's really um, important uh, and new for crack owners because they are budget based and they cannot, um, uh, their, budget, their, their cash flow is capped. And so um, at the end of the year, if they make what looks like too much money, they have to send that money back to uh, to the Treasury. And so we want to make sure that, uh, like John said, this is sort of a win win and, and owners are if they are taking care of their properties really well, then they're allowed to to uh, receive the cash flow from it. And again, nonprofit owners. So they're the ownership typically has a mission to do some level of good work in housing. And so that's really important that they get to get those money, those monies back. We, we talked about this a little bit, right? The roller coaster of public housing and funding levels year over year. And when we say high watermark in the public housing program, this is kind of what we meant, right? I don't know what I'm getting from year to year, right? I might see a snippet when house or the senate starts saying hey this is what we're going to think about doing but man <laughs> it's really hard to run a really efficient property when you don't know what you're getting right so if we're at a high watermark now the rad program you know, even though we are in a high watermark guys rad rents still aren't you know some could be great some aren't great some are below fmr way below fmr but for the ones that are close right or higher this is the opportunity to lock in and lock in now 2024 new rad rents come out. I do not have a crystal ball, but I can tell you in an election year doesn't usually mean great things for funding, right? So locking in, getting a chap, what we call committed, commitment to enter into a housing assistance payment contract. That's your kind of reservation into the program, okay? That locks you in for, for those rents until you convert. That's a big deal. That's what housing authorities probably year over year are going, oh, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I don't know if it gets much better than this, um, to be in all honesty. Okay, I'm going to the next slide and how does the, how do the rents work? Robert alluded to this before. There's a there's a formula, right? So each year, right, you're going to get this formula and it's going to be percentage go to your capital needs, capital fund, percentage to your operating needs, operating funds, right? Those are your public housing funding levels. That's your subsidy, right? And then 30% is tenant rent, right? We take that. And those are your rad rents. This is a budget neutral program. But the Congress said, hey, HUD, we want you to launch the rad program, but we're not going to give you any new money. Thanks, Congress. But we figured it out, right? We figured it out. I think we've done a pretty good job. Keep asking. Right? Keep asking. We keep asking every year. Haven't got it yet 10 years later. But um, that's kind of the key. So you lock in these high rent levels. You're at a really good starting place. The key is... Several years ago, there was a bit of a game changer. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Rad Section 18 blends or other rent flexibilities where you can start kind of pushing those rents up a little higher and then a little higher and then a little higher. We'll get into those dynamics and how that works a little bit. But if you have a good Rad base level rent, 
and then you can have some rent flexibilities. That's a pretty good way to do a recapitalization. Um, so this is how we uh, we we envision the Bradford Prac to work. Um, so, <clears throat> like I said, PACs are budget-based contracts, and so the field offices adjust the budgets. So this this is an example of a, a property that has a three hundred thousand dollar operating budget, and they have they're getting they have a service coordinator. Um, on site, that's about thirty-five thousand, and they're getting supportive services at twenty-five hundred dollars um, annually. And then they have twenty-five thousand dollars to go into their, for their capital needs and their reserve for replacement account. So then they come into our office and they say they're interested in RAD, and we make sure that they get a budget-based rent adjustment. They get ten thousand more on their operating side, ten thousand more on their um, for their supportive services, an increase for I mean, for their service coordinator right here, and then an increase for so their supportive services. And recap my team, we review their CNA and their, their capital, their reserve for replacement account goes from 25,000 to 125,000 because over the years, the needs have, have been building up and the properties need the money. And so they have 125,000 in their, or for, for their capital needs. And through a RAD conversion, they keep the same amount for their operating budget to keep the same amount for their service coordinator, but they're able to come and get that additional rent boost on the service supportive services side. So that's where you go from 7,200 here to 12,000, over 12,000. And for their reserve for replacement, now they get a chance to really look at their, their needs of their property, put together a scope of work. This is how we're going to get this work done. And now we have $100,000 to pay for our scope of work. And then once they're they're going to get all of the, the majority of that work done within a scope of work, they can bring that uh, reserve, they can bring their reserve for replacement back down to 25000 because they're using the, the funds to take the extra funds to take care of their capital needs in a uh, either a debt or equity product. Now we have the preservation rent increase where we talked about that additional rent boost. And now they're getting even additional more money to be able to do those resiliency efforts that we talked about before. And so um, this is really how the product, uh, uh, program is, is working. And we've seen much success, particularly <clears throat> in the increase on the reserve for replacement side. And we have some owners that are not just going out and getting debt, but they're also getting um, sort of other sources of funds like local CDBG or, or home funds. They're able to leverage those um, uh, additional funds to really be able to recapitalize their properties. And some of these owners are doing an extremely great job of, of, of setting these properties up for the future. So any questions about this? Yeah, key, key takeaway to that is step two and three. For you all in the back, if you look to the left, that's budget neutrality. We're working in the bounds of the PRAC program, like Donna said, through budget-based rent adjustment, then converting at the RAD rents. Luckily now we have some extra money through Congress, right? Um, Donna, you guys are seeing, I think, because of the 20 to 25 year age of the Pratt program, the reserves going from what, three, four hundred dollars per year to three, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand per year. Yeah. So you can see yeah. that's a big rent increase that goes along with that. Thanks. No, no worries. How are we in time, Robert? 15 minutes. 15, got it. We touched on this in the beginning. Two sides you can convert through Section 8, project-based vouchers, project-based rental assistance. When the RAD program was being structured, we really wanted to make this as even as a playing field as we could possibly make it, right? Programs have their nuances. We wanted to make it even. If you could guess, I'm a housing authority, right? I have public housing stock. I have a Section 8 voucher program, which administers project-based vouchers. What's the percentage of housing authorities that convert to PDV? Just a guess, throw out some numbers. Take time to property fair. That's a pretty good guess. That's a, good guess. That's a really yeah. good guess. I think it's around 70. Yeah. That's a really good guess. That's a really good, right? It's in their interest, right? They are not just the owner, but the contract administrator. 201 is you have something called an independent entity that, well, you can't set your own rents, you can't renew your own contract because that would be 
that that would be not the right thing to do. In any case, right, that makes a whole lot of sense. They get a fee to manage that Section 8 contract. On Donna's side, they are PRACs in a multifamily program. How many do you think convert to PPRA? <laughs> That's about right. What are the only ones that convert to PBV? Any guy on the PRAC side? That's right. The house, right, Michael? The housing authority. Yeah. Uh, housing authority is an ownership or management agent interest, right? But remember, they have to be a nonprofit right. or nonprofit control. Here's a bonus one. Here you get bonus points if you get this one, right? I'm a public housing authority. Why do I convert to PBRA? A couple of different answers. Uh, <laughs> it, some may say it's an easier environment for me. It's an easier environmental review process. Not a... Any guesses? Because you're the owner? Because of the financing options that they have. Could be. Because you're the owner and you can't be on both sides. So there's a tool, there's a workaround for PBVs for that, but that sometimes people may opt for PBRA. There's two two reasons why I see pretty commonly. One is their rents are higher on the PBRA side. They're higher than 120% of FMR, and the cap is 150. So if you have something called a rent comp study, just look at the different comps in your market area, you could just, if your RAD rents are that high, why am I going to be capped at 110 in the PBV program when I have 130% RAD rents? I'm not taking that. I want or like in the state of Georgia, Wisconsin, you see just about six to 10 voucher agencies, housing authorities that are also voucher agencies. Whereas the state may have hundreds of housing authorities. Some housing authorities don't want another housing authority to manage and be a contract administrator of their contract. They're in their business. They may not get along. I don't want to have anything to do with you. So I'm going to do something I've never done before and go PBR. Now, sometimes they do have PBR contracts, but that's another reason they go, I just want to manage this myself. I don't want somebody else having control. Um, so our key takeaways, though, we're not going to get too much into the details. On the public housing side, we have something called choice mobility. What that means after one year of residency in perpetuity, no matter if you're existing or new resident coming in later, you can get a voucher if the housing authority's extra vouchers move within the market. For the PBRA side, if you convert, it's two years. PRACs don't have that. Mod Rehab has all PBV conversions have that, no matter what your affiliation of public housing or multifamily. And multifamily, you can opt in to so choice. Right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's not an option? On right for PRACs, there is no choice mobility. No, no, on right oh, for, no, for public housing. Have to. Uh, it's a mandatory oh. thing. Because okay. your housing authority usually have a Section 8 program, okay. Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers program. Um, so yeah, we go next slide. And we've touched on this, guys. Long-term replace, long-term preservation, one-for-one -one replacement, rad use agreements on both sides of the house, preserving affordability. Key takeaway, though, Donna already has kind of hit this on the uh, PRAC side, nonprofit ownership. On the public housing side, it's public or nonprofit ownership. So next slide. Public housing conversion process. This is really a very small, I mean, this is small. What do you mean? This look at all these dates, it's going to take forever. This is a small piece of the development, of redevelopment on the public housing side. There's a lot of due diligence that goes on before they come in and apply for ad. Sometimes years, right? But once they come in, we try to streamline our process and make it as quick and efficient as possible while meeting the needs of our programs. You come in through a very basic application in 60 days, hopefully you get your chat commitment to enter your housing assistance payment contract, your ticket to the program, right? Then hopefully, usually, honestly, it's three years from that point, we see a housing authority then submit their financing plan. Sometimes they do it quick, but the average is by year three, right? And the notice we say 270 days, that's not very often. We actually have to extend that date several times, right? Once they get a financing plan, in, though, about 60 days of review. We get them a RAD conversion commitment. That's the agreement between HUD and Housing Authority to do all this work, X, Y, Z, right? We close on our financing, about 18 months to do the construction or rehab. 
then we have a close out process where we say, okay, come back, who returned? We want to see all the residents who were there the day of conversion and who came back after they were relocated. There's some section three requirements as well as actually the scope of work you provided us, did you deliver on it? There's a few, believe it or not, that maybe have gone through conversion without maybe a whole lot of outside funders. Maybe they're just doing a small regional bank loan or using their own money, public housing or operating funds to do just a small to moderate level of work. Never started. But now we have a whole post-closing team in place with a process. So we are catching this stuff really early, whereas before the beginning of the program, when you when you when you think of programs, this is important for the GRP side. When you're building programs, right, you're focused on certain areas, right? So we thought the rad point in time was from we started at chap, okay, to closing, and then we went, well, we have to follow up on all this stuff, shouldn't we? Whose job is that? It expanded. And guess what? Now we have a whole host closing conversion approval process. So when people come back to refinance or change ownership. They want to demolish and rebuild. Guess who that comes back to? Our office in conjunction with other offices around the building. So that point in time just keeps getting kind of extended of what we look at. Next slide, please. And Don's going to take over on. Yeah, so real high level, the RAD for PRAC process, a little different. Owners say, hey, I'm interested in RAD, but they may, may or may not know anything about it. And they come into our office, um, uh, they submit an interest through the RAD resource desk. And then we assign a RAD transaction manager, and then we set up our concept call. And at our concept call, we talked about to them about getting their budget based rent adjustment. We talked to them about the resident notification and consultation process. And then we talked to them about what they need for their conversion plan. Some owners, again, depending on their savvy, they may have uh, uh, consultants to work with them. They may have um, uh, they may be, you know, just uh, the the nonprofit owner trying to find out information for themselves. It, it, it doesn't matter. We bring them in. We share with them what RAD for PRAC is and how it can work for them and their property. And then once they have gotten their budget uh, budgets adjusted, they bring in their conversion plan. They decide how they want to do their RAD conversion. They bring in their conver conversion plan. We do our underwriting review of that conversion plan. If it's FHA, we rely on the FHA underwriter to do a significant portion of the, the underwriting, but we also make sure that we underwrite to the RAD notice and that that uh, all of that is, you know, um, uh, all of those requirements are being met. And then once we get our RAD conditional approval, we send it off to Nicole and her awesome team for closing. And um, we continue to work with Nicole and the team until we get that property closed. And when that property closed, like John says, after we have, they come back in, they have to submit their uh, their work um, their work completion um, and show us the work that they actually did, the work that they uh, said they were going to do. Work completion is not completion, work. sir. Completion, sir. Thank you. Completion, a completion sir. And uh, we have a post closing team now who does that work. So we are really happy. And and, and um, at that point, we we see the the differences before and after and how these properties are going to be functioning for the future. The key takeaways for both programs at closing is we release those old encumbrances. So on public housing, it's a declaration of trust. If it was traditional public housing, if it was mixed finance public housing, meaning you have some public housing units, some maybe tax credit units. It's called a DORC. Love our acronyms. <laughs> declaration of restrictive covenant. And then Donna has the yeah. capital advance. There's the use agreement, advance agreement, reg agreement. Those are all released, but hey, you're doing business with public, so here's a new use agreement for yeah. you, right? Uh, for, for a long-term perpetuity for public housing. Existing existing trust twenty years, which yeah. extends it out to almost forty years. Right, some properties. Right, so that's the key takeaway. So, in the post closing world, what enforcement mechanisms do we have to you know make sure that these projects you know they're, what penalty might exist? Because yeah, you know, I came over from uh, I worked on the FHA side for a long time, and if you didn't essentially complete construction or substantial rehab for an FHA project, we would have an event to default. And then the you know loan insurance would kick in and it would essentially be taken over by HUD and the project. Is there any sort of similar mechanism to me? Terrific sure. question. Steve, right? Yeah. Great question. Last Thursday I was in Chicago. Can anybody guess why I was in Chicago last Thursday? It wasn't a pleasurable trip. Um, and I usually stop by the team. I didn't have time to do that. So 
it was because we issued a notice of breach. Now, Chicago Housing Authority does great work nowadays, but in the beginning of the program, everybody was trying to figure it out. They did something called no debt deals. They use the term radomatic, but just like, I can't, it just kills my soul inside when people say radomatic, meaning I'm not doing any work, I'm just converting subsidy. How do you do that on something that's 40 years old? Yeah. It, 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 kills, it kills me inside. Anyway, um, off soapbox moment. Uh, so uh, we were out there because five, six, seven, and even eight years ago, they did these radomatics and they didn't do the work. So we have, are now standing up a compliance and enforcement team um, Jamie Campbell is on that team, uh, and we are starting to figure it out. So there'll be notices of breach, there'll be notices of default. Um, we don't have that same kind of interest when you have an FHA uh, insured mortgage. Uh, you know, we really probably want to stay away from funds stepping in to do it. We probably do a lot more workouts. Um, most of that is happening when you don't have outside funders, like you don't have tax credits, FHA insurance. Or a big bank. Um, but hopefully now as the kind of the word gets out is we're not just kind of sitting around anymore. We're actually going to be coming and doing site inspections and you don't know, do the work, things of that nature. People are going to get the message. But I'm sure we'll figure out more along the way. It's kind of, you know, it's fluid and it's growing. Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, receivership. Oh, don't use that word. That we're not getting into no, no, no. We that we really don't. HUD, HUD, HUD has no way. No interest is being a receiver. Um Gosh, we try to find other owners, right, uh, to come in, other management agencies, more operational, maybe a good management agent can come in. Um, and it's just the last thing I'd want to do is step in. We want to always do a workout. Someone else had a question. Oh, yeah, I was just was saying, would the, just talk about what you were saying, would that be like a uh, ABD or something be done? For you know, if we, that's a great, so that's, that's a great, it's terrific. You know, we really could. Um, there's actually one that, it just recalled uh there was an old rent supper app conversion in newark new jersey and the uh, legacy owner passed away and left it to their children the children had no idea what to do um four or five years of not knowing what to do you can imagine mm -hmm. it didn't end up very well uh city city actually stepped in because there was some city or state financing as the receiver um and we we essentially said we're going to transfer your assistance away unless you find a buyer so Yep, we definitely have that. That's like the first time we've used that. We don't have, we don't have, Brad doesn't have authority to use ADV, but we have transfer of assistance authority for the RAD statute or RAD notice. So we can mimic APP enforcement mechanisms. That's actually the first time we're doing this. Great work, yeah, great question. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I will say like, but the receivers will think like, you know, on next year, years ago, like if that wasn't going into receivership, where you could potentially justify it, like situation like that. Yeah. Well, Chicago dealt with that maybe 20 years ago. Uh, maybe some. You, you see a lot of housing authorities go in trouble route, and that definitely happens. That that's but you know once you convert to Section Eight, think you you know the interest with HUD's interest becomes a little yeah. bit different. Yeah. You know it really does. We touched on this cornerstone of the RAD program, where is an engagement in rights? We talked about right of return and we talked about relocation. Um, URA applies its Uniform Relocation Act to anybody relocated off site 12 months in a day. There's a full, um, a full program of protections for residents. No relocation can occur, though, on the public housing side. So we issue the RAD conversion commitment, uh, Don, aside for the conversion agreement, Don, right? There's an agreement. There is early relocation that we can't approve, though, outside of that. And getting into spending a few minutes just on some of the advanced tools. So this this was a game changer. Yeah. So years ago, you know, we talked about Section 18, not having one for one replacement, stuff never being built back. Years ago, we said, well, Section 18, I feel like, you know, we've been working kind of next to each other a lot. Feels pretty good. Maybe we started a relationship, right? And we said, okay, that this this feels like we started this old thing called a legacy blend, 75-25. And then we said, yeah, you know, this, 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 there's some, there's some likes to this, you know. So I think it was 2021, Rad Section 18, we got married, we had a baby, and we named it Blends, right? <laughs> and what does that mean? Right. So it means there's two blends. You have a construction blend, 
the more work you do, the more units are taken out through Section 18. What is that? Section 18 allows you to set rents essentially at market up to 110% of FMR. There's a rule, but it's, it, that's generally where it lands, right? What I say about RAD rents earlier, pretty low, best we've ever seen, still pretty low. So if my RAD rents are 90% of FMR, my Section 18 rents are 100% of FMR, what rents do I want? 110%, because that's a bigger revenue stream. I could do more work, right? Construction lens, the more work you do, the higher the percentage comes out through Section 18. We have 20, 80, 40, 60, and then flip those numbers, right? Depending on what goes through ad, goes through section 18. High cost areas allow the 80 percent through section 18. And we have something that's a bit more unconventional. If you get full section 18 approval, you can do 10% through RAD, 9 to 10. But that's very rare that people can do both. But it's huge because then what else do we do? We say, well, section 18, we've learned a lot of lessons. If even if it's the 10% blend or the 20% blend of the rent, all of our resident protections are extended to every resident. Everybody has the right to return. Everybody's protected with relocation protections, right? That's a big deal, right? You go to resident conferences, right? And there's a lot of, I would say, distrust, rightfully so. Whether it was Hope 6 or Section 18, failures. Just because we named something rad, we're still, believe it or not, I know it's been 10 years, proof of concept is still being delivered, guys. So that's why we have a resident protections engagement team. We're still delivering on that proof of concept, right? To say, no, guys, this is not like those other programs we promise. We actually have protection in some statutory support. No worries. And then we, we touched on this already, Donna touched on the 12 million the rent boost. And again, it's very similar to what we have in the public housing program called opportunities on rent boost. The more work you do, the more that work is based on resiliency, aging in place, right? It's based on hard construction costs. The higher percentage under high con hard construction costs, the higher the boost is going to be. Boost is capped though. That's the that's the thing in the PRAC program. Rents are uncapped now. So if you just get a budget based rent adjustment, your rents come out from 130, great. However, Donna said, most rents are really low. But we do cap this rent increase because we don't want to give too, too much. That also leads to this, the utility savings rent boost. If a lot of scopes of work, they take care of systems, right? Or building envelopes, right? But when you have a utility allowance, that cost is not passed on to the owner, right? So we allow that cost to be passed on to the owner where you get a study, up to 75% of those cost savings can boost your rents. Again, that is rent capped, right? Just to point, that's also part of the GRP program. Like GRP has that same utility boost mechanism. Right. <laughs> I think we just have a couple more slides. So transfer of assistance, just something to remember. Um, key is deconcentration of poverty, right? Sometimes you want to thin densities. Um, great on what on what set do I like? Fort Worth, Butler Place had this public housing project, gosh, 400 units, something like that. It was a triangle of highway surrounding it with one drive out, I think, yes. and one walkway over a highway. Talk about getting cut off to amenities. Terrible. Terrible. And, I mean, it was poverty concentrated, right? And Fort Worth was the other. This is not, we can't, this, we, we did, how, do we, how do we solve this, guys? And we go, well, we had this thing called transfer of assistance in the RAP program there. So they literally did what, up to 15, 12 or 15, called partial transfers of assistance. You take these three buildings and you move it into an area of opportunity. You build new. These three buildings, oh, we own these buildings. Let's rehab them. Took years, right? But I got to say, they went from 80% poverty rate, some less than 10, 20, and 30, all of them. So talk about huge success story with transfer of assistance. Amazing. Philadelphia Housing Authority does a great job with this. They have thousands of scattered site units throughout Philadelphia that the Housing Authority owns. What do they do? Same kind of thing. They say, okay, we actually want to take this assistance. We want to build or rehab something, put all the, you know, take 100 units, boom, put them here. Residents can go in, right? Then we want to use those units, those, those row homes, 
for a home ownership program or sell them to nonprofits, right? So they have a cool way of thinking about how to reposition too. But, and then we talked about Fairclaw, right? This is the newest kid on the block. Donna will kind of talk about the capital van stuff too. Very similar. Every housing authority as of 1999 has what they call fair cloth authority, an ability to build new public housing, right? We've married it to the mixed finance development proposal process. That is an existing process of how to develop public housing, right? So we place this new public housing and then we immediately convert it to Section 8. Or we essentially married into the process. And Chicago is actually doing great things with fair cloth. They're building tons of new units through fair cloth authority, right? The key takeaway to fair cloth, think about it. When we said your capital and operating funds are based on certain conditions, age, do you think your rents you're getting for brand new buildings are gonna be high? No, so that's kind of the challenge. If you don't have good rents, how do you increase those rents? You can't do a full 100 units, maybe it's 10 out of a total of 100 unit project to make your numbers work, but slowly but surely we hope to grow this program about 3,700 units in the pipeline. 